What's happening guys? Welcome back to another S2 Dry Fire Friday, except today is Live Fire. Today we're gonna to be working on recoil management and building good foundations, good principles to have good recoil management, recoil control. So instead of being in a dry fire environment, Live Fire seems to be much better. So here's what we'll do. I'm gonna get set up in a bay. Let's go through the common mistakes, the common pitfalls that I see in good recoil management. And then let's start building good principles and foundations from the ground up and hopefully it'll help everybody out. So give me a second, I'm gonna get set up and let's get to work. All right, guys, here we go. We're on range, having a good time today. Let's take a few minutes and talk about recoil management and recoil control. First and foremost, this is one of those subjects, honestly, we could go on and on about this for the next two hours, three hours, four hours, and never see the same thing twice. So let's not do that to each other. Let's keep this fairly conceptual, try and correct some of the behaviors that we commonly see that people are doing wrong, and go from there. So why do we need good quality recoil management? Well, if you guys are one of those one-shot bullseye kind of shooters where you're just pressing the trigger and then you got all day to resettle back in and get back in and make the second press, not that important to you. You should be focusing more on a quality trigger press. But if you're interested in anything like uh, self-defense, defensive pistols, tactical pistols, concealed carry, or if you're a competition shooter, then recoil management is a core fundamental skill that we need to have every single time. The concept is to keep the gun as flat as possible every time we press the trigger, so that way we don't lose that front sight or lose it for a long period of time and bring it back in, and now it's got a whole bunch of stuff going on. It just slows things down and we're less effective. We're definitely much slower. By keeping it flat, it allows us to continually make effective hits, especially when we have a shot string, five, six, eight shots in a row, when we're really getting on the throttle, being able to keep that gun flat is critical. So that's the basic idea behind recoil management, right? So let's talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that commonly people make. Now I'm on an empty gun, 100% empty. First mistake that I commonly see is a lot of people use that cup and saucer kind of method when they grip the gun, all right? Meaning they grab onto the gun and then they're using their hand, their support hand underneath it and they're kind of supporting it this way. All right, so I'll kind of give you guys an idea here. So they're doing one of these kinds of deals. And the cup and saucer method usually leads into that old Jack Weaver kind of stance. Not so good. Now you can be accurate with that in one shot strings. It's hard to be accurate with that when you're really running the gun. And so that's the first mistake that we see. When you have this kind of a deal, the muzzle's gonna rise and you're really gonna have to fight hard to settle it back down and bring it back in. So that's one mistake that we don't wanna make. The second mistake that we see is oftentimes, when people grab the gun, they don't get high into that beaver tail, all right? They're kind of low down here and there's all kinds of space down here. This becomes a little bit of a fulcrum, so every time the gun cycles, it's gonna start rocking back and forth. Again, path of least resistance, right? And so we wanna make sure that we get really high using the web between our thumb and our index finger, get really high in there and grab onto the gun, okay? So there's this, the two big mistakes that we see. Now let's get a little bit into the details. When we place our hands, you guys have all heard this, I want 70-30, I want 80-20, I want 90-10, I want 100-100. And it's like, well, yes, pressure is important, but where and what is that pressure doing is more important, all right? When people grab the gun, oftentimes they use like this monkey grip, right? They just kind of close their hand and they're grabbing on this way. What they should be doing is applying pressure. So I want you guys to think about going from the pinky up. So I want you to curl your fingers inward and really drive the back strap of the gun into the heel of the palm, okay? We wanna have pressure with a, with a strong hand back and forth, so front to back. We need to have okay. dexterity with the trigger finger. Got it. Your middle finger and your ring finger will get high up against the trigger guard. Some people even notch them out. Some guns come notched out. That's up to you, whatever you guys wanna find. And so we wanna be high up in there and that's where grip strength comes from, okay? But we need leverage on the gun. Remember what we said? This gun, it's got energy going back and forth. It's gonna wanna raise. And so that strength comes from, that leverage comes from the pinky finger. So we really wanna hammer down on that pinky finger. All right, now I don't wanna get into the biomechanics of the hand and your musculature and all that stuff. Let's just keep it simple. So high into the beaver tail, these two fingers come in and wrap in nice and tight. 
the pinky comes down and really hammers in and what we're doing is we're kind of cinching into that gun, right? We're biting in that gun so that way we have full control front to back. Now, let's get to the support hand. We see that empty space. Everyone knows that we gotta take up that empty space, okay? One of the ways that I was taught in my early days was to bring my thumb in and then use the pad of the, the meaty part of the thumb to fill that space and then half thumbs forward. Some people go thumbs up, some people go thumbs forward, some people cross their thumbs. I really don't care, honestly, that's a, up to you. For me, I'm thumbs forward. I get so far thumbs forward that my index finger oftentimes gets closer to the front of the trigger guard. I really rock into that gun, okay? And so I wanna have this. The support hand should be placing pressure left to right, okay, it's like a clamp. And so we really wanna come on in here and squeeze our, our hand together, all right? So support, a uh, strong hand, pressure's going front to back. Support hand's going left to right or right to left and making sure that we really lock this guy in. And then the last part to it, this is the part that a lot of folks miss, is that we should have this inward pressure into the frame. So not just clamping into the gun, but we're also kind of rocking our thumbs into the gun, all right? And so sometimes that causes a little bit of discomfort into the elbows and the forearms get over it you're shooting a gun if you want comfort buy a pair of you know quality sneakers here we really want to make sure that we're controlling that gun that the gun's not controlling us again it's a lot of energy happening in here we want to make sure that we keep this as flat as possible which means we have to take all kinds of precautions okay now moving more closer to the structure a lot of times people are taught to lock their elbows out okay and i was taught to lock my elbows out truth of it is you don't want to lock your elbows out. What you want to do is lock them out and back off just a little bit. We want this gun to be in here, not doing one of these guys, okay? So we want this to be able to, uh, the shock absorbers. We want that energy to dissipate up our arms, across our shoulders, and down through our legs, okay? So we want this to rock right in here, not lock them out and be, you know, like statue-like. When we see people stand tall, a lot of times their weight is on their heels. They just don't realize it. And then so, one shot doesn't matter. Have them do like a three, four, five shot burst. Like, put five rounds out in less than a second, and you'll see them get rocked back, okay? What we wanna do is make sure that they're in fighting stance. So, get their base wide open, get your weight into the balls of your feet, and really get that gun out there and get behind that sight, okay? That's one of the biggest things that will help you in recoil management. It's not what's happening in the gun, it's what's happening in your feet. When you guys are back on your heels and your feet are together, that energy's gotta go somewhere, okay? So let's widen the base, aim forward, get our belly button, our hips and our feet pointed towards the target, really get our weight into the front of our feet, get that gun out there, and make sure that we have all the pressures coming in, front to back, left to right, and then torquing in. All right guys, let's take a look at some slow motion footage here. On my first shot, I'm doing the cup and saucer method. I want you to hone in on the muzzle end of the gun. As soon as the shot breaks, see how high that muzzle rises. That'd be pretty tough to deal with if I ever had to put down a fast shot string like in a defensive situation. Here in the second shot, I am doing that monkey grip where I'm low on the beaver tail. And you're gonna see a couple different things I'd like to point out. First thing I want you to see is how high that muzzle rises. That's for sure, it's even more steep than it was on the first one, but take a look at the wrestling match that I have to have, that cleanup work at the end of the firing sequence to try and get that front sight back on target and be able to press that trigger again. Here in the third shot, I am doing that uh, regular full wraparound grip, except I don't have proper pressures in the gun. We talked about how important that pinky is, I'm leaving that pinky loose for recoil control and you're going to see that the gun does flatten out a little bit mostly because I have my hand wrapped all the way around and I'm high on that beaver tail but again you see a lot of that wrestling or that cleanup work that I have to do at the end of the firing sequence which means it's getting slowed down I'm not able to press the trigger as quickly as I possibly would need to. Going into the final shot here, everything is done correctly. I have a full wraparound grip. I'm high on the beaver tail. All the pressures that we talked about earlier are in the gun around the grip. My weight is at the ball of my feet. I'm in a good stance here. You're gonna see how flat the gun runs. 
use that berm that's behind me as a reference to kind of watch how that slide stays pretty much flat and on point and how fast that front sight returns back to target, which means I can get back on the trigger sooner and more effectively right away. Here's where something like the Mantis X10 really comes in handy. We can go to live fire range, put it right on our firearm, get it connected to our tablets or our phones, and use the recoil meter option to see what's happening with the recoil. So here's what we'll do. I'll give one shot with each method that we've talked about. So cup and saucer, low on the beaver tail, we'll have a proper grip, just loose on the pinky, and then we'll give it a proper grip. So it should be a four shots total. Here we go. Here's the old cup and saucer method. There's one, okay? Now, we're gonna go ahead and go to low on the beaver tail. There's two, okay? Now, we're gonna go ahead and get high into the beaver tail, except we're gonna be loose on the pinky finger. Here we go. Okay? And then number four, let's do it properly. Let's get good pressure, making sure that our weight is on the balls of our feet, making sure that we're not uh, doing something silly. We have good grip, good cinch grip into the gun, good lateral pressure with our support hand. Our elbows are out, but we're not locked out. Okay, so here we go. All right, guys, let's take a look at the data that we picked up using the Mantis X10. It's really interesting. It speaks volumes about what we've been working on in this entire video and there's a couple things in there I'd like to point out as we move along. So let's dive right into it. As we look at the history here, there's two particular points of data that I wanna pay attention to for this video. One is the muzzle rise, what's happening to the gun up and down. Number two is the recoil width, what's the behavior left to right. So shot number one was the old cup and saucer method. Here you can see the muzzle rise has gone up to 14.09 degrees. I gotta be honest with you, that's pretty steep. You'd have a hard time running the gun fast and hard with that kind of a muzzle rise. You're spending way too much time trying to bring that front sight post back down on target, getting a clean sight package, making a good trigger press to be able to make an effective hit. Also keep in mind that if this was a shot string, so let's say if we were shooting five rounds in less than a second, this is a compounding problem. First shot 14, second shot 18, third shot 20, so on and so forth. The more the gun moves inside of our hands, the harder it is for us to gain control of that movement mid-shot string, so keep that in mind. Going over to the recoil width, I'm not really concerned about the 4.82 degrees, I'm more concerned about where that dashed white line is, which is where the movement's happening left to right. That's happening in the top left quadrant. Ideally, that's exactly what I would see if I was shooting strong hand only. I'm a right-handed shooter, if I shot one hand only, press the trigger, you would see the recoil go high and out to the left. That's exactly what we're seeing here using the cup and saucer method. At the bottom line, there's just not enough substantial contact material happening on the support side of the gun to keep the gun centered in. Let's go over to shot number two. Shot number two, you can see the muzzle rise has gone up to 15.99, so basically 16 degrees, and I kind of expected that. This is that low tang grip. We've moved down on the grip frame and away from the beaver tail, thus lowering that fulcrum point. That's allowing the gun to get snappier in the front end, and it's just going all over the place, and that's why we're seeing an increase in the muzzle rise. In the recoil width, if you look at the dashed white line, we've kind of centered back in, which tells you my support hand is starting to do some work again. What's more interesting here is what we're seeing in that lower left quadrant. If you recall me saying that we were having this wrestling match or some cleanup work when we were doing the slow motion, you're seeing that in a graphical method here. You can see the red line picks up for the recoil, it drops down, shoots right past center line, goes down and back up, loops back around, comes back down. So we're having this kind of emotion in kind of a micro you know, space here to try and center the gun back out, and that's exactly what we'd be seeing with that low tang grip. Again, being high on the grip makes a big difference, and that's obviously evident here. Let's go over to shot number three. Shot number three, the muzzle rise has gone down significantly. That's down to 5.16. I had the full wraparound grip, but I did not have the full pressure going into the gun. So it wasn't a strong grip, I wasn't focused on the pinky, I wasn't torquing into the gun, but just by moving from the low tang up high into the beaver tail, you can see how the uh, muzzle rise dropped significantly right there. Okay, and when we go over the recoil width, this is really interesting too. Now instead of being low left movement, 
now we're having high right, and I'll tell you why. There's a sensation that we call thumbing, which means we're pressing, uh, putting pressure in with either the support side thumb or the strong side thumb. It pushes the gun to the strong side typically. When we have recoil, the recoil snapping it up, my thumbs are putting in pressure, and now the gun's moving high and right. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And again, you can see that up and down motion kind of looping around in that top right quadrant. And then finally, in shot number four, I put in the proper pressures. Now I can clean this up a little bit, for sure. Normally I'm at like a 1.8 or a 1.9 kind of a muzzle rise, but I'm usually doing that without trying to pay attention to the camera as well. Cut me some slack over here. 2.4 is perfectly acceptable. You guys saw that in slow motion, how flat that stayed and how fast the front sight post came right back on target. And then the recoil width, you could see a center back out, but it pretty much stays in that same axis. So pretty clean over there. And I think data like this is extremely important for everybody. Everybody can go by the seat of the pants dyno, meaning it feels better, it looks better. But unless you take some slow motion footage and you actually have some graphic analysis, like what the Mantis X10 offers you, you're really not sure exactly what's happening. If you really want to hone in on your training, I would highly recommend that everybody picks up a Mantis X10 at some point. I use it all the time. It's helped me immensely. I think it'll do the same for you guys. All right, guys, hopefully this video helps you guys out. We had a chance to talk a little bit about some problematic areas that we see on the range commonly. We went through some slow motion footage. We went through some graphic analysis using the Mantis X10. That's a great tool. I think everybody should have one. Now the only thing that's left is you to get on range and just go practice for yourselves. Recoil management is simple. It's just not easy. It takes a little bit of time, some reps, and then next thing you know, you're locked in good to go. Try and get in with an instructor or into a class that really helps you focus on that. But if you can't, you can still go to the range and start paying attention to the details. Take this video with you, making sure that you guys have good proper behavior. So start off with that high grip into the beaver tail, right? Making sure that we lock in our pinky, get that cinch grip. So now we have back and forth pressure on the gun. Use our support hand. Get that thumb really far forward and get that lateral pressure into the gun, making sure that we stand properly and our weight is in the ball of our feet and our body is supporting what our behaviors are with the gun. If this video helps you guys out, make sure you guys like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next video.